All right, welcome everybody to the um, Back to School Reading Network and Learn, hosted by the UDL IRN. We're glad to have you here tonight. Um, we have an excellent panelist, group of panelists here this evening, uh, as well as some of our UDL IRN members here to host the evening. So we're very excited um, to share with you this group and have them share with you their work. I am going to um, share my screen in just a moment to bring up our uh, PowerPoint presentation that kind of glide us through the evening. So I see some of you are jumping in. Pam, it's great to see you. We're, we're delighted to have you back again and welcome to uh, tonight's webinar. So let me go ahead and grab share screen. And I will bring up tonight's presentation. All right. So again, welcome to our IRN uh, Network and Learn series. Tonight, again, as I mentioned earlier, is a back to school reading. Uh, I will be your moderator tonight. My name is Sue Harden. I am uh, the UDL coordinator in Macomb, uh, Michigan. And I'm also on the UDL IRN Board of Directors and on the Professional Learning Committee, which is what brings me here tonight. So again, we are delighted to have our panelists join us tonight. Here is a sneak peek at who you're going to hear from. So Louis Lord Nelson and Patty Ralibate are the co-authors of Culturally Responsive Design for English Learners, and they're going to share with you tonight about their book. Uh, each panelist will be introducing themselves and giving you more detailed information about their backgrounds, what brings them here tonight, uh, and then introduce them their books as well. We have Thomas J. Tobin. Uh, he is the author, co-author of Reach Everyone, Teach Everyone, Universal Design for Learning and Higher Education. And also Elizabeth Stein, who is the author of uh, uh, Elevating Co-Teaching Through UDL. These are what the book covers look like. So if you're a visual learner like me and you wanna know what you're looking for when you hit the cast site or the Amazon and you're look, searching for these books, um, th these are what they look like. And you're gonna not only know the outside of this book, but the inside quite well as we move on tonight too. So we have uh, Brian Dean joining us from the IRN this evening. He will be moderating the Twitter and the chat features. So if you have a question tonight that you wanna share with us, there's two ways that you can participate. You can use hashtag UDLIRN to ask questions of our panelists or simply just treat the, tweet the wise words that they're sharing with you tonight. Perhaps tweet a link to their um, books where they can be purchased or some other resources that they might be sharing with us. And then um, we also have an opp opportunity to ask questions in the chat inside the webinar itself. So if you are um, hoping to uh, view this later on, we do have this linked on to our YouTube channel. And so you can view this webinar again or share it with others um, after this evening. Uh, so I am gonna, with that, just pass it over to uh, Louie and Patty to get started. And we're just gonna jump right in. Sure. I thank you very much, Sue, for the introduction. And uh, hi, everyone. I'm Louie Lord Nelson, and I'm talking to you from Indianapolis, Indiana. I am um, I'm a UDL consultant. That is my full life. And um, I'm the author of a couple of different books on UDL. So one is Design and Deliver. Um, and the other one is this one, Culturally Responsive Design for English Learners, The UDL Approach. And I'm just really um, excited to have authored that with my friend, Patty Ralabate, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Patty Ralabate and uh, um, uh, Louis' friend. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm delighted to be here to talk with you about our book tonight. Um, I, I also authored uh, another book that's published by Brooks Publishing called uh, Your UDL lesson planner, which we'd be happy to talk with you about another time. But uh, tonight we'll get into the meat of culturally responsive design for English learners, the UDL approach. Go for it, Louie. All right, we're ready for the next slide. So we are interested in finding out from you which of these topics are of interest of, for you and to you. So um, realizing that this could be a tough decision, um, the poll is open. You can kind of vote as many times as you want, but just 
choosing your top one. And uh, so go ahead and look through those. I'll do a quick read for any of you who are in front of a screen right now, maybe you're listening. So A is the culturally responsive learning environment. So like, oh, should say the hidden curriculum, implicit bias, funds of knowledge, rigor, microaggressions. B is crosswalking UDL and CRT characteristics. C, impact of culture on learning. D, maintaining high expectations for all. E, stages of second language development. And F, that's tiering vocabulary instruction. And so you're thinking, wait, Louie, what do I do with this? Um, this is a poll everywhere. So if you wanna go to pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V.com forward slash Louis Lord Nelson, all one word, L-O-U-I-L-O-R-D-N-E-L-S-O-N. Or you can text, and if you put 22333 in um, as the address, and then you text my name, Louis Lord Nelson, all one word, L-O-U-I-L-O-R-D-N-E-L-S-O-N, and choose one of these, A through F. Go ahead and vote on that. We're gonna give about 30 more seconds and then we'll go to the next screen and we're just gonna see what the results are and what people think. Thank you, Thomas. I should have had like music. <laughs> Give us about 10 more seconds. Are the responses coming in? We'll find out on the next slide. All right, Sue, let's go ahead to the next slide and see what's coming in. There we okay. go. There we go. So we're finding out what people are thinking about. So um, majority of you, culture responsive learning environments. Then we can see kind of a tie between crosswalking UDL. Oh, I love it when it changes in front of us. Oh, look <laughs> at that. Okay, that's great fun, right? It's gonna grow in size. All right. So it doesn't mean that people don't care about the other areas. It's just, that's where we sit. Okay, well, here's the great news. So go ahead and check, change to the next slide, if you would, Sue. The answers are all in our book. Yay, <laughs> they're all in there. All those topics are covered. Isn't that great? Okay, uh, so go ahead to the next slide and we're just gonna touch on. So when we think about the culturally responsive teaching piece, uh, I love the way that Brown University has, um, I think really articulated very nicely culturally responsive teaching. And uh, Brian, his lovely self has put a link into the chat that will take you to this information, but they have uh, separated out seven different distinct areas of culturally responsive teaching. And within their descriptors, they have the what, the why, and the how as it connects to each of these. So for example, and so you can go to the next one, so for example, learning within the context of culture, uh, this is where we start to understand, they help us understand that all learning and behavior is a result of our individual interaction with context. And they break this down, the what, the why, and the how of what this really means, what this is defined as. And so it's really understanding what the culture from which our students come, um, why that's important for us to know about, and then some how pieces. And what we did in our book was we took those how pieces and then we linked them up to universal design for learning and we put them in a table format um, with engagement and representation and action and expression. And so for example, for engagement, one of the ideas would be to guide students to explore a variety of coping skills, some of which might be outside of their cultural norms, but might resonate with them. So we're giving students opportunity to learn about cultures outside of their own self, but then helping them also learn about co what connects to themselves. Um, and then the same in under representation and action expression, we give lots of different ideas. And I know you can't really see, but there are tables like this um, for each of these seven areas as they link directly to um, culturally responsive teaching. 
So go ahead to the next slide in the interest of time. So then also we have um, what I consider to be crucial connections. And so as you saw in that survey, funds of knowledge, hidden curriculum, implicit bias, stereotype threat, and microaggressions, these are all really important topics that we need to address. And we've linked those to universal design for learning and to help you understand how you can use the framework to bring these crucial pieces to life within your learning environments. I'm not gonna go into those. I'm gonna hand this over to Patty so that we can um, have enough time for also our co-presenters. So go ahead, Patty. I think we need to go to the next slide. So, so thanks, Louie. Um, and I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about the, the second half of the book. Louis sort of talked about the first half of the book. Um, but the second half of the book gets into English language learners and the, the, the uh, pedagogy of teaching English learners. And uh, we start with a discussion of the stages of uh, language, second language or dual language development. What's on this particular screen is, uh, or slide is the uh, representation of the five stages of second language acquisition that was described by Hill and Miller. We also have in the book descriptions of the WIDA six stages um, that uh, um, uh, are used by a lot of school districts in the United States, frankly. And why would you wanna know about what stage of uh, development your students might be at? Well, because uh, you can have an influence on the development of their language by noting exactly what stage they're at you can help them to move to the next stage. Uh, we really believe, and we say this in the book, that all teachers should be teachers of language and they should explicitly teach vocabulary that are appropriate or, or linked to whatever the academics are that they're teaching. If it's social studies, mathematics, science, there's language and vocabulary involved in that and you should explicitly teach that. Uh, and in addition to crafting your academic goals, if you've got English learners in your classroom, and most of us do now, uh, you should also think about uh, crafting language goals that you can uh, use to address the stages of language development that your students are at. We can go on to the next stage, or the next slide, excuse me. Um, and this is, uh, Louis mentioned we have a lot of tables. This book is just loaded with tables. Um, and this particular uh, slide is one that I think um, shows a lot of ways that UDL can braid with culturally responsive teaching, as well as um, English uh, language pedagogy. And so what you'll see on here are different strategies or scaffolds that you might consider using in your classroom. I just want to uh, point out two, the one that says provide wait time down there on the uh, uh, on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, this is particularly important because we don't realize that English learners or dual language learners are going through double duty, sometimes triple duty in the classroom, learning uh, not only the rules of engagement, but also the academics and the language. And so we need to give them time, wait time, to be able to process information, to engage their working memory and to translate the information. So uh, keep that in mind. The other uh, one that I wanted to point out is um, here on the uh, right hand side, it says focus on meaning, not uh, verbal accuracy. Well, a lot of times what we do is we um, are so focused on the language that we interrupt the kids. We don't give them a chance to really um, say what they are they need to say, and, um, and I believe that we create stutterers in some kids. So it's important to select and target what you're going to correct or, uh, or ask students to do again, whether it's present tense S or verbal um, uh, uh, or uh, plural S, whatever it might be, and, and, and just focus on that. But on the other end of it, making sure that you're providing lots of positive reinforcement for the fact that the student is providing um, some expressive language and, and making expressive attempts in your classroom. So those are just a couple of suggestions. It gives you some examples of what we've got in the book for you that you can use uh, as a teacher of 
students who are learning a second or maybe a dual language. We can go on to the next slide. And this is our book and you can get it from CAS Publishing. And I think we've probably run out of time, but we'd be happy to talk about this in more depth later after uh, our other presenters have a chance to talk. Great. Thank you, Patty and Louie. Um, we are going to take a, a, a pause. Um, I'm going to ask one moderator question, and then um, that that will be, once we're finished with that, we'll know that it will be uh, Tom's turn to get started next. And then we'll go at the end, after everybody's presented, we'll take our questions from the audience. So Brian, I'm going to tag you to ask the, the second moderator, moderator question. I'm going to ask this first one. Uh, so this is um, for Louis. Louis, I, as I was listening to you talk about um, in the very beginning of the book about culturally responsive teaching and all of the um, components that go into doing that effectively, uh, the way that as educators, we need to be thinking about um, culture and our class or our own culture uh, and the culture of our students and those students who aren't even our students yet. I wonder if you could just share with us, if, if you're new to this topic of thinking about culturally, culturally responsive design, what would you suggest as the best first step for a classroom educator, a professional learning uh, coordinator? What, what might be the best first thing to do as you kind of approach this topic? Uh, to me, it's identifying what resources feel good to you. Um, Teaching Tolerance is an incredible website um, that can provide tips every day. You can ask for that email um, and they will send you um, precise um, activities or things to think about in your classroom that are digestible uh, and they feel good. Um, I'll, again, going back to what Brown University has produced, and if you wanted to click on that link, I feel that they've broken these components down, these seven areas down, to again, also feel really digestible and you can read them and do just some self-reflection on, oh, um, that, that resonates with me, that makes sense to me, I can start with that here. Um, and then other things you might read and you think, I, I, don't, I have no clue how to start with that, that's okay. Um, keep that there so you wanna learn about it but start with the things that resonate and you're like, oh, oh, this makes sense. I can make this change really easily tomorrow. That's great. Yeah, I think that, you know, we often hear about um, these really important ideas and it's sometimes it's difficult to know where to start. So offering those few suggestions was a great idea. I, I just feel strongly that, you know, this idea of building this place for belonging is so important. So thank you for sharing those two resources. All right, we are going to um, hand it over to Thomas J. Tobin if you want to get started. Thank you very much, Sue, and thank you to Brian and Corinne who are behind the scenes doing the duties for us, uh, monitoring the chat. And uh, I noticed that we had some folks here on the live webinar from Chile, so I'll say bienvenidos a todos, and uh, some folks from Singapore as well, so I'll say uh, selamat datang to all of you as well. And welcome, definitely. Uh, this is, you see on the screen, a photograph of me and my co-author, Kirsten Bailing from Tufts University. Uh, we decided to write our book as a guide for everybody in higher education because we, uh, Kirsten on the disability services side and I on the faculty development side, over the past many years, we have been seeing really excellent examples of campuses who get it, who are moving from compliance to culture, to commitment. And uh, we wanted to share their stories. And also we had some ideas of our own. So there's a lot of good theory in the book that you're going to see. And I wanna give you uh, a sort of super seven overview of what you're going to find in the book. And if you could move to the next slide, we'll talk about these big themes and the stories and the core skills. The first one is, Everybody talks about accessibility. And in many people's minds, when you're talking to a president, a provost, a campus leader, a department chair, when you say accessibility, they make a mental mistake. And they think about 
people with disabilities. Now, all of us on this webinar, we know that universal design for learning is a framework that goes way beyond disabilities and helps us to lower barriers for all of our learners. And so we take the word accessibility and we chop the end off when we talk to our colleagues and we talk about access no matter why. And that leads us into the next slide. On the next slide, you're going to see that we want to reframe universal design for learning. Instead of talking first or only about people with disabilities, now I have to be careful when I say this because I am an advocate for people with learning barriers of all kinds. But when we talk first or only about people with disabilities, other folks think, oh, that's only for 10% of people or it's just for those people over there. When we talk about our students on their mobile devices, we talk about our students who have work responsibilities, family responsibilities, military deployed learners, anybody who has a barrier. The real barrier in higher education today is not distance in distance ed. It's time. People are battling against the clock. And so on your screen, you see a couple of folks who have gone down to uh, Orlando and they paid the extra money to go fight a lightsaber battle against Darth Vader and the stormtroopers, except the one guy's on his phone. So if we can give people 20 more minutes for studying or interaction that they didn't have before, that can be the difference between I'm struggling and I'm keeping up. On the next slide, you're gonna see that we want to also talk about universal design for learning both in terms of the neuroscience, multiple means of engagement, multiple means of representing information, multiple means of giving people choices about how they demonstrate their skills and actions. But we also want to say this is kind of secret knowledge because when we talk about neuroscience to most of our faculty colleagues, they kind of glaze over. And so in the book, we want to offer a radical suggestion, which is on the next slide, that universal design for learning is really just plus one thinking. This isn't the be all end all. There's lots of expert level universal design for learning to come, but this is a really good way to get people into the first step of UDL. Think about all the interactions that you have, your students have with the materials, yes, but with each other, with the instructor, with the wider world. Every time there's an interaction, think of one more way to have that interaction and you're going to be in a good UDL mind frame. And if you flip to the next slide, when we ask our faculty colleagues, oh, well, you can do all these UDL things, they say, but I have 82 two minute videos and you're telling me I have to caption them yesterday? And then they suffer from analysis paralysis and they don't even start. So what we also do is we try to help to reduce that barrier in people's minds. Ask your faculty colleagues, where do your students always ask the same question? Where do they always get things wrong on the tests or the quizzes and forces you to do reteaching? And where do they always ask for alternative explanations? Hey, gee, Professor Tom, that was great, but I still don't get it. Those are the places to start with plus one thinking with universal design for learning. And it's a really good way to get people to see UDL as something that's manageable, something they can put their brains around. But the next slide is an important point from the book. Don't train just the faculty. If we expect faculty members and instructors alone to shoulder the burden of doing inclusive design, we're not going to move beyond the 10 to 15% of instructors who are doing inclusive design right now. We need to train our IT areas, our media services folks, anybody who supports faculty members in good inclusive UDL practices so that when the faculty member comes to somebody and says, hey, media services, I really want to do lecture capture. Their response is awesome. We'll send a student and a camera into your classroom and we'll help you chunk it up into four minute segments and we'll help you with the captions because that's just what we do here at our college or university. And then on the next slide, you're going to see as well, we give you some secret boss training. How do you talk to a president or a provost, the person who has the purse strings, who can release time, money, people to help you with phase one of your UDL project? By the way, don't call it a pilot. That means that it'll be over. Phase one, phase one of your UDL stuff. And we tell you how to talk in terms that they understand. And we show you the research that leads to UDL principles 
when they get applied, leading to greater student persistence, satisfaction, and retention. And we go into that in depth in the book. And the last piece, which is on our next slide, is we want everybody who reads this book to become secret, sneaky evangelists. We want you to be able to talk to your colleagues in ways that they will see benefit to themselves and to their learners when they're adopting UDL principles. And so we give you a roadmap and some scripting to help you do just that. And as a, a little bonus for everybody on my last slide, uh, if you go to wvupress.com, you can save 25% on a pre-order of the book with this special code just for our UDL IRN friends. It's reach teach. And you can put that in when you do your pre-order and nobody on this webinar should be paying full price for this book. So Kirsten and I are really excited to have this book coming out on November 1st, 2018. And uh, I'll turn it back over to our hosts and I'm looking forward to the Q&A and learning about our other books here on the webinar too. Thank you. Okay, I'm giving it over to Brian. Brian, do you have a follow-up question? Well, you know, I, I don't really have uh, uh, any questions out, out, out there in the Twitterverse that are really popping right now. Um, but uh, what, I, what I really like, uh, it's more a comment than anything else, Tom. Uh, what I really like is that um, you've gone step by step and you kind of laid out this, this really, like this bureaucratic pipeline of, of finding a way to find some progressive education within it, right? Um, and that phrasing, a lot of people have retweeted that phrasing, um, uh, don't call it a pilot. And I think that those, those two things combined are, are worth the price of the book, right? Being able to, to, to uh, navigate through that pipeline system and be able to get the people who are oftentimes in the, the gatekeepers of that pipeline as allies on your side and moving forward uh, that's, I think that's a brilliant way to lay out that, that piece. Um, it's one, so, it's, it's uh, one of the reasons that we wrote the book, Brian, is that yeah. there are a lot of folks who can help you with, here's what UDL is, here's how to implement it at the level of one course. And so what we wanted to do was take you through the book from what is UDL? Here's the official definition. Here's how to do it in miniature. Here's how to do it in one course. Here's how to adopt it as part of a program. And then here's how to get your senior leaders on board and adopt it outside of just courses in things like the student service areas and make it part of what your campus does. It's amazing how few of your colleagues will scream, academic freedom, I want to do it my own way, when they're being supported to get multiplicity into all of the kinds of interactions that happen across campus. And that's what we really want to do. And that's why we want to, to, to talk about creating evangelists, helping people to spread the word. And this book contains not only just the stories, but it's also the forms, the formats, the rubrics, all the little tools that you will want to use. And we're also telling you those stories of the colleges and universities who made it stick and how they did it. So definitely looking forward to the rest of the Q&A and thank you. You know, I, just one more thing I'm not, uh, before we move on. So, so Thomas, this, this lays it out really nice if I'm working through a university, but, it, but is there a, you know, can I use some of these things if I'm working in my school district or, you know, in a large, a large school district or a pretty bureaucratic heavy school district? Are there, are there tips and, and tricks in there for me? The, the secret here is that we wrote this specifically for a higher education audience. Mm -hmm. True because there are a lot of books that address the K-12 school district uh, audience. At the same time, almost none of what we're saying is something brand new or completely different. So if you're thinking about your district administrator, your school board, your building principal, and you're trying to make those arguments, the chapters in our book will help you there as well. Brother, that's what I was looking for. I was trying to lead you down that path and you took it. So I, 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 I appreciate it, man, because uh, as soon as you start saying forms and, and, and how to get through it, I'm like, ooh, I know some districts that are, that are you know, pretty happy with their forms. So, uh, <laughs> you know, or, or need, to, need to find a new way to do those. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Splendid. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Thomas. And we're going to um, introduce our next author, Elizabeth Stein. And Elizabeth, I'm going to let you take it away and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your, your new book. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you to Brian and Corinne and you, Sue, and everyone over there at the network and all the participants. It's uh, just really such a great honor to be here and to be such a part of such a great, amazing panel. It's humbling to 
to be sitting here listening to all of you and to actually go last. It's like I feel the connection with every all of the work that we do. It shows the power of how UDL is so um, just just purely organic. So uh, my approach for tonight, the, the minutes that I have with you, I, I'm hoping to make it as conversational discussional dialect di dialogic as possible. So you have my um, my email, you have my Twitter, uh, you also have my website, you can contact me. Um, and the next slide, which, all right, you can go too quickly, Sue, but then come back. Okay, this slide will, has the link to an hour long webinar all about this book. So um, that you can do like maybe Friday night, you know, no, okay, not Friday night. On your own time, you can maybe watch the video if you're interested to learn more about the book. And now just, if you can go back to the other slide, thank you so much. So um, I'd like to start with just kind of um, behind the scenes, like how this book came about. Well, first of all, like I have the need to like hug it right now because it's like this living, breathing, you know, lived experience all within the pages of this book. Because the way that this book came about um, started about eight to 10 years ago. Um, and I was co-teaching and some of it was going well and some of it was going not so well. And in all honesty, most of it was not so great. Um, and I started to think about, well, what is it at the end of the day that, that could make me put my head on my pillow, you know, safely and, and knowing that I'm doing all I can for kids, regardless of what I'm dealing with within uh, working with teachers and, and different um, school settings and so on. And UDL just came my way. It gave me the language. It gave me the, the, the peace of mind to know that I was doing everything that I could for kids, no matter what. And so um, eight years ago, I decided to transition from elementary to middle school. And I thought, okay, I'm UDL ready. I got this. I'm going to be you know, really immersed with the content. I was really excited to move to the curriculum and, and really work on self-advocacy with kids. And I was in culture shock beyond beyond my wildest nightmares. And uh, although it was very good, it was a very good nightmare, if that's possible. Um, I just learned so much about myself, again, because UDL is to the rescue. And what I started to do was journal. I started to write down everything that I was going through and solutions. I always um, was using my UDL um, knowledge to apply to learning more about UDL and how it can be a solution for me in my situation. And so what I felt when I was at the middle school level was I just felt like another general ed teacher in the classroom. And I was being forced to, to teach this great, wonderful content. I loved that part. But as I'm up there in front of the class, my like I was twitching because I couldn't, I knew that there were a few kids who needed certain things that I wasn't able to do because I'm on my own in front of the class because co-teaching then was more about taking turns. And so co-teaching models were like not uh, very well known uh, by anyone else in the school where I worked, in the district actually, this is going back a ways. Thankfully now all is well, co-teaching models are well set, uh, co-teaching, uh, you know, the models and the instruction and UDL is finally making its way. But I really had to uh, work through the barriers and that the journaling helped and that that's really what became this book. And um, the question of, well, what makes some co-teaching relationships and experiences work and some not work? And in all my research and my connections with people across the nation, it seems to be the go-to response is, oh, keep co-teaching pairs together. That's the answer. Keep them together, give them time and co-teaching will work. Well, Yes, that's true, but it, ha it has to be more than that for many reasons. One reason is you can keep co-teaching pairs together and they're actually secretly miserable <laughs> and it's really not working, but yet it looks like it is. And so the other piece is it's, it's completely impossible and I'm not, all, I'm not about making anything impossible, but it really, this is one of those impossible things. You cannot keep every co-teaching pair together every year, forever. It just doesn't work that way. We need to go with the flow. We need to be flexible. And I think you're starting to hear the themes of UDL, right? That flexibility and that open mind to like really um, do whatever it takes to, to make something work. And so what I was able to do through my journaling was come to, to I, I thought about all of the barriers that, that interfere with co-teaching and it, it narrows down to two categories. Can you believe that? Just two. One instruction, 
And that where you can fit in all your classroom management, your strategies, your instructional decisions, your uh, needing to meet the strengths and the needs of diverse learners and, and making sure that you're including everyone and so forth. Instruction, it encompasses so many of the little uh, problems that add up to a lot. And then the other one is communication. That's the co-planning time, you know, the pet peeves that each co-teacher has and the general uh, necess necessity to collaborate ongoing in an ongoing manner. So instruction and communication. And so that's like really within this book is, is all about solutions to the instructional and the communicative barriers that are present in every classroom anywhere USA and beyond the USA, global. And so um, some of the solutions that um, I put forth in this book is, um, it really comes down to three solutions. So one is apply the varied co-teaching models, but then you have to go beyond the models. Just, just applying the models is not enough. We need to make sure we're differentiating, right? That's a, a, a big a uh, hot topic that's that's still lingering around, but it, it's it's has to be done in a proactive way. So we're not retrofitting. We're not we're not giving Sally a graphic organizer because she needs help organizing her thoughts. We're we're planning we're we're planning the curriculum so that it meets all of the variability in the classroom. And that's where the UDL mindset comes in and using the UDL guidelines as a way to pave the way for specially designed instruction. So it comes down to those two categories, instruction communication, and then embracing the co-teaching models, going beyond that with using um, the guidelines, which are on the slide in front of you, and also embracing a UDL mindset, which I go into depth into the book. So um, the book itself is, I love the way it's organized. It's, it's a part one and a part two. So part one, it gives you all of the theories, the ideas, the concepts, the language that you need to be able to communicate in a UDL mindset-ted way if that makes sense. And then the part two is the action. It's like now you have the language, you have the, the knowledge, you have the the, the, the desire, obviously. Um, and so now here are some ideas for how to put it into place. And one of the biggest themes of this book is taking the UDL um, idea of creating expert learners, right? We want learners in all of our classrooms who are purposeful, resourceful, strategic, right? Well, what about our teachers? We want that for them as well. And when we have co-teachers in the room, we need to make sure that each co-teacher is being compassionate and, and available to give permission to the other co-teacher to express the expertise that that co-teacher has as well. So it's not just one teacher teaching a lesson. And so one a quick example, time check here. Okay, I'm doing pretty well, a couple of more minutes. Um, so one example of how this puts into place is, um, so we have the purpose of UDL, which is creating expert learners. We have the meaningful access, focus on flexibility, collaboration, and learner variability, right? So if we take those ideas and say, hey, let's weave that into the co-teaching relationship, like, Wah! that's like kapow. You have no idea what, you'll feel the ground shaking and rumbling. It should be to the point where that if each teacher is valuing the expertise of one another, when one teacher has to be absent, it's felt, it's missed. There's this, you know, critical missing of that other teacher. And so this book connects to that idea that we're all learners and we're going to be including both teachers, including the students in the process of the teaching of the UDL process and including administrators. And there's some um, work in the back. There's sample letters that teachers, that I, I actually wrote these letters with students and other co-teachers. It's just a sample. You can take it and use it as is, or you can use it as a mentor text and create your own. But just the idea of creating some sort of letter from you, your co-teacher and the class as a whole, the whole learning community, sharing it with an administrator, inviting administrators in, making them part of the process. And so back to that one example. So before, it'll be like a before UDL, after UDL kind of scenario, and I'll keep it real simple. So um, the book goes into more details. So really simply, uh, you have um, an English lesson, 
generally teacher comes in and says, okay, we're reading this and, and I expect all the class to, to answer the comprehension questions. Super basic, it happens every day. So what happens in this before UDL way is typically the general ed teacher will be the, the main teacher and the, the special ed teacher or the um, ENL teacher will be the one to walk around and, and just help as needed, right? It's that monitoring side-by-side -side teaching that, that can isolate students and really stigmatize some students and also takes that teacher out of the loop of the flow. And so we, we want to make sure, and, and then, okay, so finishing that thought, then it's time to answer the questions we're bound to have students who struggle answering the comprehension questions because even if the text was presented visually and in an auditory manner, you're still going to have students whose needs weren't met. So after UDL, and this takes no planning time, um, which is one of those barriers as well, instead of complaining that we have no planning time, okay, UDL mindset, we say, well, what can we do about it? So this particular lesson that I'm sharing, a very uh, abbreviated version of, this actually happened to me. So this, um, no planning time whatsoever. And so in the moments I said, how about we get into groups? And so we created um, a quick slide to show students the choices that they had. They could go into the silent reading where they could just sit at their, wherever they want in the room and silently read. There was a section where the, te the text was on an audio. They could listen to it or they could sit in the group where the teacher was reading it aloud and it would be a shared read experience. And so, um, and it freed up one of the teachers to monitor the other two groups. And so, um, and it also freed up both teachers to kind of walk around and monitor. And then following the group time, the one or the other teacher gives a quick recap, summarizing the text, then giving the students time to turn and talk very quickly to put it in their own words, paraphrase it, then go to the same questions you had originally and you'll have students who had more meaningful access and two teachers who are meaningfully active within the classroom. So that sort of gives you a little bit of um, an example of what, what co-teaching with UDL looks like. And again, that took no planning time to do it. It just takes two teachers who are willing to uh, respect one another's expertise and the process of learning for every individual in the room. And um, yes, so thank you so much for listening. I feel like I was talking very quickly, but that's what happens when you're on UDL speed. You just get so excited, you just keep going. So thanks for listening. <laughs> We've all been there, that's for sure. Um, you, you know, as I was listening, Elizabeth, that you know, really resonated with me the idea of um, focusing it on the language first, right? Starting with that UDL mindset. We talk about that a lot as we're getting people sort of indoctrinated, if you will, to the UDL and what that means. You know, that idea of uh, having shared expectations and being real precise about what we what we mean. So that really, and then then moving into action, of course, made, makes a lot of great sense. I was curious as you were talking about the the instruction and communication as those two critical parts for co-teaching. Um, I, I think you're right on in that. And I was, you know, thinking and reflecting on um, most of us on this webinar are pretty comfortable with uh, the UDL framework, how and how it has an impact on instruction. But I hadn't really given a lot of thought to how the framework really shapes communication, especially communication amongst two professionals. And you gave us a, a few examples about that. Could you dig in a little deeper on that idea? I think it's quite fascinating that um, applying our, what our deep knowledge already that we have about uh, how we think about uh, learning and, and culture to communication uh, amongst ourselves and with our colleagues. Can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So it's amazing. You look at that, the UDL guideline, it's one sheet, right? It's one sheet of the most powerful information that really drives everything. Like you can talk about um, differentiated instruction, it's in there. Talk about understanding by design, it's in there. Talk about all of those, those great research based practices, it's all in there. And it's backed by decades worth of research. So you know, when you're referring to these guidelines, you know, you have, you know, you can get into that power pose and know you've earned it. And so um, in what resonated with me with your question was um, the UDL guidelines serve a great um, way for communication in 
so many ways because um, people I work with across the nation and beyond, it's, you know, some are savvy with the language and some are not. So obviously this, this guideline works. It's, it's simplified in terms of you can chunk it, you can look at it into sections and you can just kind of refer to it within, um, you know, manageable parts so that those who are not new with it really resonate with it and grow their, their intelligence with it as they're comfortable. And for those who are savvy with it, it just keeps them anchored because, you know, we get lost in the craze of what happens every day. All those external, you know, stimuli that, that comes our way, you know, we get lost in the parent conversations we're having or the administrative requests that, you know, all of the demands that we have. And this just serves as such a strong anchor for saying, okay, so what's my worry for today? What phone call do I have to return? What am I, what am I worried about? What am I struggling with? And here's a solution. Here's one word could just pop out of the guideline and, and could really direct your, your, you know, direction, direct your direction. That was really great, but it can really guide you to, um, again, being a solution seeking person so that you're not dwelling in the abyss of, of problems. Thank you. I, 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 when you were talking about that last portion of it, it, it made me think of uh, take a deep breath and just repeat UDL, UDL, UDL. Right. Right. Exactly. That's your mantra. <laughs> That's great. Yes. All right. We are going to open it up now to questions. So I'm going to tag Brian and Corinne and see um, what we've got out in the world. Now we could do a couple of things. We could get out of this. Um, presentation and, and just have faces or we can hang in here. What, what do you guys prefer? Brian, what's your, what's your draw there? Uh -oh, um, I, I like, I like looking at everybody's face. Um, this is, you know, it's a, it's a star studded event. So, you know, got okay. Then I'm going to, I'm going to get out of this presentation Then I will stop sharing my screen. We're going to go with Brian's suggestion that here we're all here now. All right, Brian, I'm gonna hand it over to you to ask those questions. Well, actually, I don't, is, is Corinne, um, Corinne's been monitoring the chat and we haven't really heard too much from the chat. Corinne, if, you, if you're able to jump in and ask a question. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna keep my face muted for now, but I, I will unmute my mic. Um, uh, just a, a question um, regarding the, the co-teaching book. Um, there was a question from Kathy wondering about she teaches talking about um teaching with working closely with her grade level partners um and wondering if this book and some of the strategies and resources provided in um in the book would also help for those who don't co-teach but are working closely co-designing lesson designing with grade level partners maybe content area part partners across grade levels so um any insight into that Yes. So yes, yeah, a great question. And it's one that I've, I've received many times. And so yeah, so we call it co teaching, we can call it collaborative teaching. Uh, some call it co serving. Um, it's really just about being human, you know, teaching together. It's about, you know, really collaboration, regardless of whether you're in formal co teaching pairs or not. So um, yeah, the strategy, every strategy in in here would would work well, for whatever collaborative uh, mission that you're on. Excellent. I think that um, would be such a, a valuable resource for so um, many, many people. Obviously, co-teaching, um, there's a huge need for it, but, um, you know, lots of emphasis on, on working co more collaboratively with our, um, with our teaching partners in general. So to have that, be able to use and apply those same strategies um, would be would be very, very beneficial. Um, the, um, looking for other questions from the panel. Um, I don't have any other specific questions from the panel. Um, Brian, do you have anything from the Twitter feed? Uh, Twitter's a little bit quiet tonight besides, uh, besides the, the, 
you know, the flavor text there, the quotes that everybody's putting out there. Um, what I find really interesting, and and maybe I'm, I'm maybe I'm last to the game, which is which is not you know it's not unheard of. But um, not only am I going to have to get a bigger bookshelf, but all of these pieces start to fit together in this really really great way. Um, each one of your books that you've talked about tonight start to fit together, and, and it really came became really apparent when when. Uh, Elizabeth, you finally said, you know, it's about, there's variability in communication, right? And so from a culturally responsive lens, here's a variability of communication. From an institutional lens, here's a variability of communication. From a co-teaching lens, here's a, here's a variability of language and communication that happens and collaboration that happens. Um, and so uh, maybe I'm just starting to draw that connection. Um, and you folks have already kind of been there and you're like, yeah, thanks for, thanks for showing up, Brian. Um, but but that, seems really, that seems really, really incredibly powerful to me. Um, just, just as a, as a movement, as we move UDL forward, that's this really just an interesting way to frame it in my head. So uh, I just, I guess I'm dropping that. Brian, uh, yes, this is uh, this is Patty. I just wanted to respond to that, and that um, that was one of the first really big realizations I had about NEA uh, about the UDL when I was working at CAST. Um, was that I was I, I was thinking initially that it was just this thing about how the brain worked and you know how it would enhance our teaching. And then I started to realize that it's about almost everything we do because it goes to how we are neurologically organized as human beings. And so it influences our relationships with other people, like in co-teaching. It, it influences how we organize ourselves in terms of systems and systems implementation, like what Thomas was talking about in a higher ed system. It, 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 it can be related to almost everything. I was having a conversation this weekend with my nephew who teaches restorative justice. It connects to that, you know? So it really is one of those, um, ideas that permeates throughout all that we do as human beings, I think. Yeah, I start to feel that. I start to feel that like um, UDL is this river, right? Like it's the big river and everything else that we kind of talk about are these boats that sit on that river. And, but UDL is the way that we're going to get there, right? Like it's the navigation. It's the, it's the, it's the means of, it, or it's, the, it's the, the way, to, the, the highway of transportation to those things. So as Tom, I did, uh, Thomas, I didn't mean to, to cut you off, brother. Why don't you jump on in? Oh, no worries. Hey, everybody. This is Tom. I wanted to, to take Patty's idea and, and take it uh, down three notches, actually. And one of the questions that I saw on Twitter and also here in the chat is, how do you get people to take a first step? And I hear in all three of the books that we're talking about tonight, here's how you take the first step. And then all of us are pointing out to where you can go to make it an iterative process, to make it moving from just finding out to proficient to expert level. And what I love about, uh, especially Elizabeth, when you were talking in, in your book about with co-teaching being a model that doesn't change what we teach, how we teach it, doesn't change the level of rigor, doesn't change really our approach. What it does is it changes how we think about the interactions that are taking place between all of us as instructors, between us and our colleagues at our schools and institutions, and then between us and our learners. And that's really what it's all about. And if I, if I had to take any lesson away from the conversation that we're having tonight, it's for everybody who's watching the recording and everybody who's here on the live webinar, go back and start thinking not about the content, but about the process. And, and I, I really love that thread through all three of our books. Louis, explain this. Explain this to me. It says it's the zip line. Uh, I'm I'm immediately intrigued. Immediately intrigued. Let me know what's up. No, it goes back when we were sitting next to each other uh, in Allison Posey's presentation um, at the Cast Symposium, and she had us kind of working on some visualization. And I was talking about how the the zip line. Uh, so it kind of takes us back higher up in that sense that Thomas was like, oh, bring us back down. But I, I see it as this, yeah, it's, uh, I see it as the zip line of, of getting us through and across the, the land and we're looking down and we're seeing how everything is going and, and we're, 
we're affecting the design over all of that as as we're going along. So a zip line I know goes fast, but it's way fun. Um, Cause I think when you get into it and you get, um, you release yourself from um, that seriousness of, I have to know what every checkpoint means. Um, it's okay, you know, it's okay. Just, you can dig into a few of them, get to know them, um, see what, I always go back to see what feels right. And uh, once you start connecting with everything, then it just start. It, it does. It starts coming. But you gotta you gotta keep learning. I'm not gonna lie to anybody on this webinar. I'm never gonna say, "Oh, you'll know it when you start." No, I'm sorry. You have to learn it. You have to sit and you have to study. You have to think about the framework. Um, uh, you may come into the framework from a mindset that may make things a little bit more acceptable to you. Um, but you also may have come from a mindset. So, you know, the first school in which I taught, mm, that mindset really wasn't there, right? So if I'd had UDL, UDL presented to me within that setting, it would have been a little bit more challenging. Um, but then later on, I, I was in an environment that had a mindset that allowed me to, oh, okay, I see um, there's some open opportunities here. There's some flexibility. Hey, there is accessibility. Hey, you know, we didn't call it variability at the time, but um, but that's you know what we were what we were talking about, right? So, um, so anyway, I I I do want to emphasize that you do want to spend time with the framework, but then as you're getting to know it and you allow yourself to have just a great time using it, let it just blossom your creativity, then that's what I think about the zip line because you're just there and you're just going and it's, and it's way fun. And I got to tell you, hanging out with the people on this webinar and plenty of other folks, um, I'm sure you're going to do a plug for the UDL chat later on and, you know, and get people connected because it's just the energy starts to pop, right? And it's not just energy. It's not just, oh, I feel good. I feel good. It is you know, I feel good because I'm getting really good, solid, pedagogically sound ideas that I'm going to be able to use in my classroom, in my school, at my university, wherever your learning environment is tomorrow. You got to get yourself in with those people and and, 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 it, and it's going to be good and it's going to be the zip line. You're here. Yeah. Right? Like, I'm just, yeah. I just sit back here going, preach, Louie, preach. <laughs> <laughs> if I could jump in, I'd love to jump back in because I love the I love that zip line too. But I I also love what Tom said too. So so Louie, I'm gonna bring us back down and we're gonna get grounded because like when you were up there and we're viewing what needs to be done or what how things are working, then we have to like hit the ground again and say, okay, well, what's already working well? Right. So something that I do that's really powerful and it kind of um, answers Sue's question that she raised to me before as well as if you take the guidelines and reflect on a lesson and see, OK, well, what what's one way that that I, I'm already, you know, implementing UDL? It's already in my lessons. This is one way. Like so the zip line works and then getting grounded to see like, hey, what are you already doing? That's that really motivates teachers who are are either new to applying UDL or, or just trudging along using it to really stay with it and, and get that, that energy that you're talking about, Louie. So it's great. Thanks. As I was listening, I was thinking about, um, Louise had mentioned, um, we're going to bring us back up again just to kind of cap it off and then give everybody a chance to say a, a final few words and then we have to sell some soap. But I was listening to you talk about the zip line, Louie, and it just made me think that we, we don't often think about what is the spirit of UDL, but I, I kind of was walking away from that conversation thinking that we need to start looking in the direction of joy and belonging. Right. Those those are two really powerful words that I think the UDL framework helps us bring to children and to classrooms and to learners and and to other places as well. And, and you know, what a great way to end the night. Uh, all this content we get to read, but really at the heart of it is about belonging and about uh, feeling feeling happy and feeling joyful. So thanks for that zipline analogy. <laughs> OK, we're going to. Um, 
start at with Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, if you want to just give us a, a, a few final words and we'll move to Tom and then we'll end with Patty and uh, Louie. And then we'll uh, give a few commercials at, as we close out. Sure, thank you so much. First of all, great honor to be here. Again, thanks to every single individual here. And um, yeah, I, I love the, what you just said, the joy and um, the belonging, because that's what really it's all about, is having students feel safe. And I connected with um, words of David Rose, without the limbic system, you know, learning just doesn't happen. So that joy and that sense of belonging will keep students relaxed and calm and creating that space for, for them to understand, not just creating the relationships, but also uh, gaining the content that they need to become academic learners as well. So it's really educating the whole child. So thank you for that. Have a great night. And thank you for joining us tonight, Elizabeth. We really appreciate it. Hi, everybody. This is Tom. And uh, my last word is, here's the book. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want to say very thank you very much for having us for the UDL IRN. And to all of you who are here on the live webinar and those of you who are watching the recording later on, all of us authors, we speak, we consult, we love to continue the conversation with you. You can find us on social media. You can find us at our websites. We're not just our books. We are part of the conversation and we want to hear from you. So definitely reach out. And even if it's just a 20 minute phone call, we'd love to hear your stories. So thank you all. Oh, and thank you for joining us tonight and reminding us that authors are people too, <laughs> and they love to share. So everyone, make sure you reach out. If you uh, aren't sure how to spell everyone's name, you can just go ahead and Google it. Of course, it is here on our slide deck, so you can um, watch the recording again to grab those books. All right, Patty, you're going next? Sure. Uh, I just wanted to thank um, the UDLIRN, you, Brian, and Susan, and uh, our fellow authors here on the website, uh, on the the uh, uh, webinar, but also I wanted to thank the folks who joined us to hear about our books. Um, it, we, we don't get a chance to really market our work the way that other you know, book uh, authors do. And it's, it's, it's you who really helps us to get the, the word out there. And we appreciate you joining us and sharing the books with other folks. And if you ever have a question, you know, we are, the, just like Thomas said, we are available. Just give us a call, send us an email. Uh, we're happy to help explain where did we get that idea from, whatever it might be. Uh, we'd love to uh, continue the conversation. There's a synergy about UDL that um, once you, you catch it, it's like a virus uh, and there's no way to cure it. It just grows and grows and grows. And so we'd love to share it with you. Thanks. Thanks, Patty. And Louis, we will let you have the last word from the authors tonight. Um, I just love spewing UDL. And so this gave me an opportunity to just talk about it even more. So thank you to the UDL IRN and all of you participating and um, everyone who's called in. Um, and it's just the same message that Patty and Thomas and Elizabeth shared. So thank you, thank you. All right, we are going to just share a few more things with you um, about the IRN and some upcoming events that you're going to want to know about. So I'm glad you've stuck around. Uh, we wanted to just let you know that um, we have two events uh, that are actually live events, not just webinars, that we want you to know a little bit about. The first, we want to talk about our second annual UDL IRN Great Lakes UDL Experience. So this is um, coming up soon, November 12th and 13th. It is uh, in Clinton Township, Michigan, um, a two-day event where we are bringing some of our uh, favorite people into the uh, the um, experience. We have uh, David Reed, who is an architect, who will be talking about classroom and environment design. Allison Posey will be joining us and talking about designing to improve executive function. And our very own Brian Dean will become will be talking about culturally responsive classroom design. So it's a two-day structure. The first day is really uh, uh, 
opportunity to learn content connected to these three ideas and how universal design for learning fits into those. We'll have other breakout sessions on these topics. Uh, you'll have a chance to hear from practitioners who are implementing these um, frameworks inside of their classrooms and also panels to talk about, again, these three topics. Day two is a deep dive with your planning team. So we're asking teams of educators to come to day two. Uh, the planning will be facilitated by David, Allison, and Brian, and it'll be a chance to really talk about uh, implementation uh, around uh, classroom environment, around executive function, and culturally responsive design. Uh, we had great response from our uh, workshop last year. Lots of people very engaged with the learning and excited about coming back. If you have a chance to be in Michigan in November, come join us. Uh, you can sign up on the UDL IRN website. So there's a link to registration. It's open, and we'd love to have you join us. The weather's great, y'all. Awesome. The weather is great. <laughs> Come in November. It's the best time. It is. It's, it is beautiful. Um, and also a reminder that Summit 2019 is, um, is happening. It's happening in Orlando, the same place that we had Summit 2018. Uh, it is a little earlier this year. It is in March, as it has been traditionally. Um, so you can see the dates here. We have pre-conferences on the 27th with the summit on the 28th and 29th. The call for proposals is open. So if you want to share some of your ideas about UDL implementation, UDL research, UDL theory, uh, please jump on the website. Um, there are lots of opportunities to present in a lot of different styles and manners. Uh, so if you want to share, we would love to hear from you. Brian, you want to jump in on that? Get those proposals in. And if you have not ever gone to the summit, you are missing out. Uh, it is, uh, it is what it, well, first of all, we get, we get a ton of people, but if you like food trucks and you like uh, UDL and you like uh, crazy suits and you like um, just an experience overall, that's what the summit is. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, check it out, get your proposals in, uh, make sure that you've blocked off the 28th and the 29th and definitely the 30th to recover. So that's it. All right, this one's you too. Yeah, so UDL chat, y'all. Um, if you want to keep the conversation going in the virtual world, um, UDL chat is an amazing opportunity. It happens every first and third Wednesday. Uh, the panel, the panel of moderators uh, is amazing. Everybody from Mindy Johnson and uh, uh, well, our very own Elizabeth Stein is one of our moderators. Uh, I'm a moderator. Um, Ron Rogers. There's a great. There's just a huge group of folks. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we get every, every, uh, I'm sorry, every first and third Wednesday, we get down to some talking about some practical stuff around UDL. So make sure that you follow the hashtag cause it's open 24 seven and, uh, make sure that you join us. Great. And with that, we just want to say thank you. Thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to, uh, the IRN team and, and especially thank you to, uh, our participants both here tonight with us and those that will uh, watch later and those who are watching on YouTube. Uh, we do appreciate your constant enthusiasm for uh, the IRN and the work that we do and, and for doing good things for kids. So everybody have a wonderful night and uh, we will see you in September. Everyone great back to school start. I hope uh, things start well and crescendo from there.